All right. Hey, good to see everybody. We are in the sixth and seventh chapter of Exodus, he says, with some faith. All right, taking it on a, a, a word of faith here that we'll not only cover one, but possibly two chapters at once. I'm not sure I've ever attempted this type of leap of faith in this class before. The degree of difficulty is pretty high for me, so pray for me as we go. We're jumping in at uh, Gen uh, Genesis, Exodus chapter 6. It is Exodus. Yes, here it is in the Bible, right at the beginning. Touched on this last week, but I thought it'd be a great place to pick up. The Lord said to Moses, now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. Indeed, by a mighty hand, he will let them go. By a mighty hand, he will drive them out of his land. So we're talking about the Lord. And I mentioned last week, what a blessing to hear God's name proclaimed in that land. Now think about Moses and what it meant for him as an ordinary person who also has his own faults and foibles, his own fears. Um, he has been once to see Pharaoh already. How did it go for Moses? Not so great. Uh, Pharaoh didn't listen to him. Not only that, Pharaoh turned up the heat on God's people so that uh, Moses felt the, the heat coming from his own people, the Hebrew people, saying, Now you have made our labor even worse. You've made us obnoxious. Remember that phrase from chapter 5, meaning we are like a bad odor, is what that literally means, like a bad odor to Pharaoh, and he's treating us even worse. So the people are mad at Moses. Pharaoh isn't listening to Moses. Moses goes back to God. So this is where God spends time in this next paragraph is to give Moses some reassurance. We could, we could call this paragraph God renewing God's promises to God's people, well, to Moses directly. Look at verse 2. So, God bless you. God also spoke to Moses and said, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. But my name, by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known. To, I, I find this very interesting. Remember the relationship between God and Moses. And it is not a perfect one. Remember, God gets angry at Moses. And, and even in one of the chapters, we talked about Moses maybe being angry at God. Is it okay to be angry at God and, and faithful people in the Bible? And I think about Psalms, like Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, where faithful people are kind of shaking their fist at God like Abraham did. Um, so it's a real relationship. Not real pretty at all times, but it's a real relationship. Maybe you've had a real relationship in your life. Maybe, like me, you've been married. So you understand what it's like to be in a real relationship where there's joys, but there's also struggles, right? And you work through it. Well, that's what's happening here. And if you're listening carefully, it sounds like God is kind of leaning in close to Moses and says, you know, I talked to your forebearers like Abraham and I. They were very special among the Hebrew people. These are the great founding fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I revealed my name as God Almighty. But only to you, Moses, did I say Yahweh, giving you even a more personal name. Remember that from the burning bush scene. So God's reminding Moses of this. Verse 3 to me sounds like a very loving friendship or relationship between God and Moses that God is leaning into, getting close with Moses here. Almost as if you could imagine a father with his arm around the son's shoulder saying, I told my most personal name to you, Moses. Now, God goes on to uh, renew his promises about the covenant. Verse 4. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they resided as aliens. I've also heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians are holding as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Now, remember, I've said Exodus is about remembering. So remember what we understand remembering to mean, first of all, this is the story being told and retold by God's people of how God worked through Moses and Aaron to save them. 
So remembering is the right thing to do. It's an act of worship. It's an act of faith, of reassurance, of reaffirming our faith. But it's also a word here in verse 5 where it simply means God remembered his covenant. Unlike a human being, God never forgot. It's not that God had forgotten the covenant and now 400 to some years later, God is waking up and, oh yeah, now I see that string on my left finger. You know, that's not it. It means now God will act. Now God will act upon. The time is right for God's mighty acts of redemption or deliverance, exodus, setting free. Um, so, verse 6, Say therefore to the Israelites, I am the Lord and I will. Now I want you to take a, uh, on, some of you take notes, you don't have to because I'm going to give you a list when I print this up for you in my summary. Um, but if you've got your pen, you may want to take a minute and just underline these verbs as I go through the next two verses. Verses 6 through 8, there are seven promises that God says, I will do. So Moses is supposed to take this word from God and tell it to his people, the Israelites. I am the Lord, and one, I will free you from the burdens of the Egyptians. And two, will deliver you from slavery to them. Three, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm, with mighty acts of judgment. Verse 7, this is number four. I will take you as my people, and I will be, so number five is more of a relationship. I will be in relationship. I will be your God. You shall know that I am the Lord your God who has freed you from the burdens of the Egyptians. And verse eight, number six is, I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I will give you, verse 8, the second part of verse 8, is the seventh promise. So God is renewing these promises in the actions that God will take on behalf of his enslaved people. I will set free, I will deliver, I will redeem, I will take you, I will be with you, I will um, bring you to the new promised land, and I will give you that promised land. So God is a promise keeper. We mentioned that at the end of chapter 5 in one respect because chapter 5 where Moses goes and does as God has asked him to do, confronts Pharaoh, but has little success, one would ask the question, well, where was God? Moses went and showed up. Didn't God show up? Now we understand God was preparing the time and also seeing how Pharaoh would respond hardening the heart of Pharaoh. So Pharaoh is becoming more and more stubborn. And this is actually part of God's plan. But let's go back to the seven promises because God is going to do this. He's going to do it largely, you know, in big view of, of all the Egyptian people in the face of Pharaoh, but also for God's own people to see God acting as a promise keeper. Um, and it just gives me pause to reflect on the number seven, particularly in the Torah, Numbers have particular meaning. That's true through the Bible, but you see these um, patterns and um, repetitions, and that's important. We don't want to pass it by. Do you think of the number seven as a special number? Anybody? Some people nodding their heads yes in agreement. Um, there's different ways that we interpret seven in our own society. We often think, uh, in contrast to 13, by the way, anybody else like my wife and I, we were born on the 13th, so... 13 babies, and we feel like that's a good number. All right. But a lot of people don't like the number 13. So, you know, it's got a bad rap. Uh, and we're not talking superstition. We're going to talk about why seven is God's number. So today we might just say it's lucky number seven. But think about how God makes a total of seven promises here. Where else do you hear the number seven in the first few books of the Bible, in the Torah? Genesis, Genesis seven days of creation. Um, so God created everything really in six days, but the seventh day is the Sabbath. That's God's holy day. Even God took a day off, you know, and that's part of the issue here with God's people is that they don't have a Sabbath day. They are enslaved to work 24-7. So seven is an example of God's number. Um, the Hebrew language, so another thing I hope you get out of this class is just to get a little taste of Hebrew. I am no Hebrew scholar. You understand already because you've heard me. I don't pronounce it very well, but I love some of these little bits of information like this one that a rabbi shared with me. The first 
words in Hebrew of the whole Bible are, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In Hebrew, it's only seven words. It's only seven words in Hebrew. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so all of these numbers of seven remind us who is ultimately in control. It's God who's in control. It's God who's created everything. It is God who will redeem, keep his promises set free, be with his people, bring his people into uh, that promised land and so on. So um, I also want to lift up one thing I closed the class with last week. In these verbs, in verse 6, gaal is the word in Hebrew for redeem. It literally means to ransom and avenge with force if necessary. So when God is saying to Moses, tell the people this, they would be hearing more than we hear in our English word redeem. They'll be hearing that God is ready to take action with a mighty hand and use force if necessary to bring his people out of this oppressive uh, situation, slavery situation uh, in Egypt. So I don't want you to forget that. I want you also to listen in those seven promises for overtones of marriage. Now, it's not expressed directly here, but in the Hebrew prophets, particularly Hosea, uh, likens Israel, the people of God, to be like a bride to God. And certainly we get this in the New Testament with Jesus as the bridegroom, the church, Believers, the new Israel, we are the bride of Christ, that sort of thing. Those overtones are there, and the reason to bring it up is I will be their God. They will be my people. It's like the marriage covenant, and in the Jewish uh, marriage tradition, there are these seven promises made and so on. Um, but the reason I want you to hear it is, again, how do we understand God and that relationship with God that's being depicted here is ultimately one that says God is faithful, God is true. We can trust God to deliver on God's promises. And ultimately, this is the language of love. This is the statements here, uh, trusting, even though it doesn't use the word love, trusting God is to understand what we would say in the New Testament, to have love that casts out fear. Okay, these promises or this reiteration of the promises to Moses helps to cast out his fear. He has to go again to Pharaoh. Think about the big ask. This is a huge ask, heavy lifting, uh, that God is asking of Moses, who feels like he already failed, who not only couldn't succeed persuading Pharaoh, has now gotten God's people turned against him. And so he has to really go solo, well, with Aaron, but he really has to go solo, not even having the will of his own enslaved people with him to go negotiate with Pharaoh. But, of course, God is saying God is with him, and it's ultimately a love language that God is using, and that perfect love is to cast out fear. This reassurance, these promises reiterated, are to help Moses to have the courage to go again and face Pharaoh. So God goes on. Let's, let's look back at the scripture, verses 10 and 11. The Lord spoke to Moses, Go and tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, let the Israelites go out of his land. Well, that's plain enough. Moses knows he has to go, but what's Moses' response? See if this feels like you've, you've seen the movie before, right? Like, like, haven't we already gone through this with Moses? What does Moses say? But Moses said to the Lord, The Israelites have not listened to me, and how shall the Pharaoh listen to me? Poor speaker that I am. This is yet another reiteration of Moses' own resistance to do what God has asked him to do. And I don't want to interpret this as it's being out of disobedience or lack of faith, but it's human. I think it's, he's being human here when he's saying, I'm still struggling with this, God. He's fearful. Thus the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, gave them orders regarding the Israelites and the Pharaoh, uh, charging them to set free the Israelites from the land of Egypt. Now the action gets interrupted with, well, you've looked at the Old Testament before, right? So it's not surprising to see genealogy, perhaps. But there are some curious questions that come up in the genealogy at this point. I'm not going to read, but I want to highlight in verse 14. It starts with these um, ancestral houses, <coughs> Reuben, the firstborn of Israel. Now, I tell you, 
it makes me hungry just mentioning his name because it's like one of my favorite sandwiches. <laughs> but other than that, when I read Reuben, there's not a lot of data that comes to mind. What I want you to hear really is the firstborn. The understanding in, in not only Israelite culture, but in ancient patriarchal cultures virtually around the world, <clears throat> the, the conventional wisdom was the firstborn son is the one who gets the blessing, actually a double blessing by law, usually property law would give a double amount to the firstborn son. And there would be the birthright, the blessing of kind of being you know, head of household, the one to be looked up to is the firstborn son. And so the uh, genealogy starts with that, but that's not where Moses is, by the way. Uh, verse 16, here are the sons of Levi. So the writers of the Torah, or let's just say in remembering, this is about remembering, in remembering Moses rightly, we need to connect him with the line of priesthood throughout the Old Testament, which is the Levites, the tribe of Levi, who had, uh, Levi had sons. But look, Moses, when you get down to verse 18, Amron is named as Moses' dad. He's a son of Kohath, and that's in verse 16. He's not the uh, firstborn. Moses doesn't come out of the line of the firstborn is the point here. Why is this important? Um, Moses is not the firstborn son or in the line of Levi out of the firstborn sons, but in his own right, by God's choosing, Moses is firstborn in the sight of God, in, in the faith calling that God gives to him. Um, so that's important. Now, is that odd? Well, when you look at the witness of Scripture, the Old Testament, so certainly in the Torah, but all the way through the Old Testament, some of the greatest, let me just read them out, uh, were not firstborn sons. Abel, among the two boys that were the firstborn of Adam and Eve, uh, Abel is lifted up, Shem, Isaac, Jacob, Levi, Judah, Joseph. A lot of the book of Genesis is on the story of Joseph, and he's nowhere near the firstborn, right? Ephraim, and then of course, King David, not being the firstborn. So the whole point here is Mo Moses stands in good company among those who are not the firstborn sons. And it's as if to say, God does a lot of good work through other uh, people in the lineage. Um, God often challenges the conventional wisdom of the overarching culture, and that's what's happening here. Now, another person had asked, um, well, look at Aaron. So Aaron, Moses' brother, obviously it's important to state Aaron's lineage because the Levitical priesthood is really followed through in the Old Testament out of the line of Aaron. And uh, Aaron's sons are named, but Moses' sons are not named. And you could read into that. Some people certainly have interpreted that negatively about Moses or his sons not living. You know, a lot of times you have a famous man in history, but his sons don't measure up. But I don't think that that's the point in the genealogy. I think the point is to, to name Aaron and Aaron's sons because that line is the line that the stories of God in the Old Testament, the people of God, follow for priesthood. Uh, but again, I think it lifts Moses up in that way, like King David. Moses was not important in and of his uh, birth, but his character. That's why the first few chapters of Exodus do so much to outline Moses' uh, intentional choices to choose to, do, to stand up and to do what's right on the side of justice, uh, especially for God's people, which is what he's going to do now. So you have this whole of chapter 6. Just checking my watch. I mean, could it be that I'm coming down to the end of chapter 6 in half the class time, 23 minutes? Oh, my goodness. Feeling pretty good. Just let me enjoy that for a second. Uh, I'm at the last couple verses. 26, chapter 6, 26. It was this same Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, Bring the Israelites out of the land of Egypt, company by company. It was they who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the Israelites out of Egypt, the same Moses and Aaron. It's interesting, the repetition here, so it might make you wonder. Uh, like I've said, Exodus is really written about remembering. And so this is people generations later 
adding that line in there to say this is who we're talking about. Our, our famous ancestors, Moses and Aaron, uh, and reiterating that as if in, in worship and in reading of the scriptures over and over again, they needed that reminder. Uh, it's quite likely, you know, these are the books of Moses, that they are the stories of Moses and told by Moses and written down by Moses and or his family or scribes. And then again, in the time of exile, when, you know, about 600 years before Jesus, to use round numbers, uh, the Israelite people had to flee, uh, taking an captivity out of Jerusalem. The temple was destroyed and they were overthrown and they were in Babylon in exile. They needed to remember. They needed these reminders. So we kind of overhear their, you know, there was no way to make a headline or to bold print or to underline things. People didn't do that. But they repeated the words again. This is the same Moses and Aaron. We're talking about important people in God's history of our people. So that's why you get those repetitive verses, I think, uh, in, in the end of chapter 6. Chapter 7, are you ready? Strap on your seatbelts. We're getting ready for a ride. Here we go into the height of the action, the conflict, the ten plagues begin in this chapter. Um, very interesting that one of the first things you hear is that God is going to put Moses in the role of God. What? I mean, honestly, that sounds sacrilegious, doesn't it? But let's, let's dig into it. Chapter 7, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh. It might be, in English, uh, easier uh, to swallow pill if it were rendered. I think it's fair to render the English like, I will make you as God or like a god, maybe put a small g, I would prefer, uh, to Pharaoh. Pharaoh understood himself as a god on earth. The people of Egypt viewed Pharaoh as a deity, a god with a small g, I would say, uh, a god to them. And so God places Moses on the same level in Pharaoh's perception so that Pharaoh would receive Moses and Aaron as a peer to him and not as some you know, minion or some ordinary person. So God has done this and, and given uh, that kind of perception uh, of Moses to Pharaoh. So I think that's a very powerful statement. Again, for me, another way to frame the book of Exodus is a battle between the gods. And here the battle begins. So God, the true God with a capital G, is proving that all other gods with a small lowercase g are not as strong as our God. And so we have to enter into the scene of the battle of the gods in this way. I've made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet, God's spokesman. You shall speak all that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart and will multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt when Pharaoh does not listen to you, I will lay my hand upon Egypt and bring my uh, people, the Israelites, company by company, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, and I will stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out from among them. Moses and Aaron did so. So they did, just as God commanded them. Moses was 80. Aaron was 83. There again, it's just a little remembrance line. By the way, these people were in the prime of their life. That's what the scripture's saying. Did you know that about being octogenarians, if anybody's made it that far yet? God is saying, you're in the prime of your life. This is when I choose you to do big things. It's when you're 80 or 83, whatever, doesn't matter. I'm with you. That's what God is saying. So, hey, take heart if any of you are aging at all out there. I'm, I'm aging, so I take heart in this. I'm not 80 yet. I hope to be one day, though. All right. So what's happening here? Let's get serious, Jason. I'll go back to my notes. So God has purposes. God has God's purposes and acts in human history. And there are purposes in the plagues that we're about to cover. Uh, the plagues, for one, will force Pharaoh's hand so that God's children will go free. Also... You can read this, the ten plagues, as appropriate punishments 
for the pain and suffering afflicted upon God's people. So you can understand, you know, the Bible will use the word judgment sometimes, but understand it also as God's justice. Justice might be the better word for us to use today. Also, the plagues serve this purpose, demonstrating that God, our God, the true God, is real, not the many gods of Egypt. They are not real. Although we'll see some power from Pharaoh and his <clears throat> magicians. But, but first a word about this. Collective sin. Is there something called collective sin as opposed, let's say, to individual sin? Now I will tell you as Americans in our time, particularly in my experience of kind of mainline churches, we tend to speak about sin as individual sins. And that's important. And that's right. That's where we spend our time focusing on it, though. But is there a collective sin? Could there be such a thing? Um, the Torah certainly answers yes. And you could understand God's judgment and justice in Exodus with the ten plagues particularly as the right actions of a right God against the wrong actions of people in the wrong, the, the Egyptian people. Now, it's directed primarily at Pharaoh kind of as an individual, we see him as kind of, you know, he's the king, so he's the one who's got these policies. But back in chapter 1, verse 22, even Pharaoh had said now he put it on all the people, all the people of Egypt to what? Uh, purge of the Hebrew people by killing their baby boys. You know, so this whole thing went out and it was not just the king or his administration, but also the people of Egypt. Um, so we can understand that. And I think as Americans, if we're honest, we can also understand our own experiences of collective sin or the difficulties that we've had around race, our own history of slavery, uh, the American Civil War. Our Civil War was fought to end slavery uh, and we paid such a great price. Think about the numbers. In a time when our nation was only 31 million people, we had something over 600,000 soldiers on, you know, collectively, north and south, give the ultimate sacrifice of their lives. Uh, and we, we did end slavery, which is a good thing. But you can understand that as how the whole, the whole of the nation suffered uh, under that. And that's what's also, in a sense, happening in Egypt then at this time with the ten plagues, is that everybody's going to experience some suffering. But Pharaoh feels it first, and we have to go there. We have to understand a little bit about Pharaoh. I find it helpful in verse 5. Let's go back to verse 5. Um, when I talk about the purposes of the plague, I just read this, um, and we're going to talk about how it hits Pharaoh. But God's purpose is that all the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against them. So one of the things to keep in mind is God's demonstrating who God is and how God can act for justice, uh, just as Moses has acted for justice uh, and we see his character. We'll see God's character in this way, too. Um, Pharaoh would have had an ancient philosophy or religion, pagan religion, belief that there were many gods in nature. Nature was the ultimate god. And in Egypt, the ultimate symbol of the ultimate god in nature is what? That big river. You can't get away from the Nile River. And in fact, the Nile River was a symbol of life. So it's so interesting. Um, gosh, there's so much to talk about. Here I got here so fast, and now I'm worried about having enough time. All right, stop interrupting yourself, right? Um, let me not pass by verses 8 through 13. Let me read that. Lord said to Moses and Aaron, go to Pharaoh when he says, perform a wonder. Take your staff, throw it down before Pharaoh, and become a snake. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did it. Aaron threw down his staff, and it became a snake. Verse 11, Pharaoh summoned the wise men and sorcerers. So this is going to factor in. We've got to talk about this a little bit, but I'm not going to do it yet. The magicians of Egypt did the same. Their, their, their sticks also became like snakes. So it's interesting. So you, you kind of see this set up as sort of like the, the overture to this battle between the gods. So each side kind of demonstrates some power. This is like if it were a war, there'd be sort of an opening skirmish, and each side would shoot their weapons, a little volley here back and forth, but, but no damage done yet. We're just kind of testing each other's out. All right, verse 13, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. 
That happens a lot, the hardening of the heart. We're going to come back to that. But what I want you to focus on is imagine who this Pharaoh is and what his lifestyle and his philosophy might be, right? Getting a little Sun Tzu here, art of war. You got to know your enemy, right? So try to understand who this person is. And when there's these 10 plagues, certainly God is kind of meeting Pharaoh on his own ground, his own turf here, and showing God's true power in the face of what Pharaoh represents or what he believes. So each of the plagues, interestingly enough, each of the plagues will correspond to at least one of the Egyptian gods in their sort of pantheon of pagan gods, right? The first plague is about the river Nile. And the river represented the Egyptian god Hapi, H-A-P-I. You don't have to write this down. I'm going to give you in the summary notes, I'll give you the whole list. I'm not even going to verbalize all of them right now, but I just want to give you a few. So the first plague is the river, and the Egyptian god is Hapi, and there are other Egyptian gods associated with that wonderful source of life because it was so big. It represented so many things. It was to predominate Egyptian culture for millennia. Uh, basically, you would think God has a purpose to strike the Nile first when it's probably the biggest representation of their mythology and their religion and their belief, as well as their just plain everyday life system of agriculture and everything, right? So that's the first plague is about the River Nile. And then there are frogs. There's an Egyptian frog god, by the way, if you didn't know that. Hecht is the Egyptian frog god. So God confronts and defeats that god. There's a plague of lice. Uh, you might think, no way could the Egyptians have um, a god for a little pest like mice, but it, it really represents the earth god, uh, gods like Hathor or Newt. Um, then there are flies, and certainly the Egyptians had a lord of the flies. You thought it was a novel. I had to read it in school. Uh, but the lord of the flies was an Egyptian god for sure. So I'll get you the list later on, but here's the point. Nature in Egypt, nature to the Egyptian and certainly to Pharaoh, uh, was a god, uh, understood that nature ruled the world. There, there was no separation between, say, a higher deity and the created world, but nature itself was like God. Now, for us, right from the beginning in our Judeo-Christian heritage, our belief is God is separate from, distinguished from, greater than the creation that God has, right? So we learn that in those first seven words in Hebrew. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So the earth is part of God's work, not to be confused with God, God's self, right? So creator is greater than creation. But in a lot of um, primitive pagan religion, even to this day, it's the same thing. You know, they, they deify the creation and worship the creation rather than the creator. So that's what was happening in Egypt. Um, they were so dependent upon the river. Think about that for their own life. The cycles in, in nature and, and the high water or low water uh, affected their agriculture, affected their crops, affected their livelihood. So it's understandable how people in that primitive time might see the river God uh, and nature, the river Nile particularly, as the highest form of power on earth. So the other thing about nature is that it's amoral. Nature or creation has really no soul in that sense. It's not a moral being, and that's why it's not worthy of worship. Um, the Psalms would say, you know, the, the earth is the Lord and, and the fullness thereof. Uh, the earth belongs to the Lord. It is not the God itself, right? So it, it's, it's a way of saying that we can look at nature and nature praises God just as we should praise God, but nature itself is amoral. Uh, humans who have soul, who have free will, have the ab ability or the free choice to be into a mutual relationship with God. Therefore, God is worthy of our worship, not nature. All right, I'm making a lot out of that, but I want you to know, trying to get the distinction here. So Pharaoh would go out every morning to the river. This was the source of life. This was his pagan worship, but also he probably just needed to wash his face you know, like a lot of us do. Maybe not all of us, but I hope you do. Uh, wash your face in the morning, uh, all those things. Uh, that's where God meets Pharaoh. Uh, he says to Moses, oh, I'm going to lose the verse now. 
uh, go out when Pharaoh in the morning. It's verse 15, right? There it is. Chapter 7, first plague about the Nile River. God says, go to Pharaoh in the morning as he's going out to the water. This is his religious practice, Pharaoh's practice. Stand by at the river bank to meet him. Take your hand and the staff that was turned into a snake. Say to him, the Lord, the God of Hebrews. Remember, now that's the name in chapter 3 that God said for Moses to use as God's calling card. You go say to that skunk Pharaoh, say it's the God of the Hebrews. So he's going to know, Pharaoh is going to hear this and say, what? These enslaved people who work for me have a God that's bigger than me? That can't be the possible uh, outcome here. No way. Uh, anyway, that's Pharaoh's hard heart talking. So the God of the Hebrews, God says to Moses, sent me to say to you, let my people go so that they may worship me in the wilderness. But until now, you have not listened. Oh, don't let that phrase go by. God is turning up the heat a little bit. Now, back, you know, in the previous couple chapters, we heard Pharaoh use, you know, kind of flex and use his power to say, I'm going to turn up the heat on the Hebrew people, make them work harder without giving them straw. Um, God is kind of saying that to Pharaoh now. Until now, you have not listened. In other words, he's saying, I'm going to get your attention this time. Now you're going to sit up and pay attention to me, God is saying to Pharaoh. Verse 17, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. See, with the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is in the Nile, and it shall be turned to blood. Think about that for a minute. The fish in the river shall die, and the river itself will have an obnoxious odor. Where did we hear that before? Obnoxious odor. Wasn't that what happened when Pharaoh treated God's people even worse, the people's complaint to Moses was, were like a bad odor, obnoxious to Pharaoh. Well, now God's going to use that same word, that same experience, but much more literally, and turn, God bless you, turn this, this, this symbol of life, this thing that everybody depends on, this river, into blood so that it stinks to them. Interesting. A little bit of irony. Poetic justice, if you will, in that word, that it stinks. Um, the Egyptians shall be unable to drink from the water, from the Nile. Uh, verse 19, Moses, I'm sorry, Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, take your staff, stretch it out over the water. So that's what happens, right? Um, Moses and Aaron, verse 20, did just as the Lord commanded. In the sight of Pharaoh and his officials, lifted up the staff, struck the water. All the water was turned into blood, and the fish in the river died. The river stank so that the Egyptians could not drink its water, and there was blood throughout the whole land of Egypt. But, verse 22, the magicians of Egypt did the same thing. So let's talk about a couple of things. We're going to talk about those magicians, but a step before that is here we are in the 21st century. You all are highly educated people, highly intelligent, and it may be a stretch. When we hear this, did that really happen, people ask. I mean, just a well-intended question. Uh, there are those believers, I'm going to say believers, um, certainly scholars, who have helped to explain the miracles or the plagues in Exodus as, well, like an extreme intensification of natural phenomena so that there could be, at that time, that the river... Uh, had turned toxic. There could have been an algae bloom of this sort of maybe dark red or purple algae. Uh, some had suggested there's a type of uh, bacteria that makes water look purple like that, and, and it could have turned it to that dark color. Not only that, it certainly would explain the stench from the river if it were a, a algae bloom, killing many fish and making it, you know, unfit for human consumption. I don't, so I like to think about, I think I've said this to you before, I like to think about the Bible having inexhaustible interpretive potential. So you can, you can understand it and believe it, and it can be true that someone else can understand it and believe it in a little bit of a different way, right? So I'm not taking it away if it helps you to think that God uses natural phenomenon, intensifies it, uses it for a purpose, making a point. Sure, 
It also could happen just as it was written um, and, and quite literally, you know, strike it with the staff and God did that mirror. Either way, it's God who is acting. That's my point. Either way, when you read the scripture, however you might imagine that the water of the Nile could possibly turn to blood, understand that it's God's work and God's timing and it's God's miracle for God's purpose. Think about why it would be blood. Why would God, in an act of justice, turn the river to blood? Now, God is not a uh, overly violent or angry God in that sense, but God does use retributive justice, right? And so who had put blood into the river before this? Pharaoh. Pharaoh, by telling people to drown the Hebrew babies, had turned the river to blood in that sense already. And so in a sense, this is an act of justice on God's part, and it should serve to convict Pharaoh's heart, to remind him you have done this cruelty first. So whether or not that were the point, it certainly didn't happen to Pharaoh's heart that he got convicted, right? What, his heart was hardened even more. Um, but let's look at the magicians. I've mentioned, they've been mentioned a couple of times in these uh, chapters and don't want to go too far past this without lifting up some understanding about the role of magic. In the scriptures, Old Testament and New, there is acknowledgement that people practice certain forms of magic or sorcery. It's never lifted up as a good thing. Um, how does this happen? Well, in every culture, there's been some uh, you know, use. Uh, uh, they were people, even prior to Jesus, who claimed to have powers of healing, and, and the, the regular people would call them wonder workers. So there have always been uh, magicians or sorcerers or wonder workers, and, and they would use... Uh, powers in nature, they would use certain tricks of illusion or sleight of hand, uh, even witchcraft or the work of the devil. And however you want to rationalize or understand that, that's what's happening with Pharaoh. So it, it and by the way, the scripture's not written in such a way like a reporter who's given you exactly the chronological happening here of when Moses or Aaron strikes the stick that every single drop of water was blood instantly because even though it may read that way a little bit, you still get down to verse 22 here and you see that the magicians still have to find some fresh water in order to show that they can do this magic trick too. Well, it's not a magic trick. It's a miracle. What's the difference? God does powerful acts through God's power, not the power of the earth or the nature or the witchcraft or anything. And God does that for God's purpose, and that makes it a miracle, a supernatural event that is caused by God. Uh, different or distinguished from acts of magic, which, interestingly enough, you know, Pharaoh's people, his sorcerers, uh, could do it, but they couldn't match God step for step for very long. They could do the first couple of things. The, the, uh, the staff or the rod that turns into a snake, uh, the, the Nile turning to blood, uh, and one or two other things, I think. And we'll get to that. But, but they're done. It, it's, you know, the gig is up pretty quick to find that Pharaoh's people can't keep up because of human strength alone or of our own understanding or wisdom alone, we cannot approximate the power of God. And that's kind of the full point here is to show that it's God and God's power at work. Uh, verse 3 in chapter 7 was that statement, my signs and wonders. And then throughout the last few chapters, by a mighty hand. So it's about God's might or power, his hand, his signs and wonders uh, that have this purpose. Ultimately, it's for the purpose of doing good, showing justice and compassion, setting God's people free. So, you know, Pharaoh and his side, they're acting in bad faith, trying to do harm, or at least, if they weren't trying to do harm directly to God's people, they were wanting to keep everything the same, maintain the status quo, stay in control so that certain people can't have freedom. Uh, it's interesting to connect the dots here and be reminded of God's highest purpose God desires freedom. God desires religious freedom. In this case, particularly for God's people to be 
set free from slavery so that they can worship God freely. That's so important. In Egypt, they couldn't worship because they would have had to have, uh, I mentioned this before, um, say animal sacrifice as one example of God's style of worship for God's people back then. That would have been seen as uh, sacrilegious. Uh, killing an animal is like killing a god, small g, god, uh, back then. And so God knew God's people needed religious freedom. And so these powerful acts, the plagues, are done for God's purpose by God's power. Um, Egypt, the Egyptians, Pharaoh, his people, uh, uh, minions or his court, um, his officers, they were all vested in building an earthly kingdom. God wants to set God's people free, even today, to build what? God's kingdom, not our own, not a worldly kingdom. So the battle of the gods here is really about God setting people free so that there can be new birth, a new beginning, a change, a birth of a new way of life, a way of worshiping God uh, that hadn't been since before the time they were in Egypt. So what happens to Moses and Aaron, I don't want you to miss this. You know, we read the drama, we read, here, here's how the action unfolds. But think about them as real people. Aaron and Moses had to believe. They had to believe and trust God that there was a new day coming, that there was a new way that they could be in community together with people who believe in the same God, and that God could deliver on God's promises to make that happen. So when we read this, you know, a lot of attention is certainly put on these plagues or the miracles or how it unfolds, the action. But remember how important it was for someone like Aaron and Moses to freely choose to believe God in such an extreme circumstance. You know, I just don't want to discount because certainly the Torah and here in Exodus particularly, an act of faith called courage. This virtue of courage is lifted up time and again. So just think about what kind of courageous heart did Aaron and Moses have to have within them uh, in order to believe and act in this way. And, and here's why I want to lift that up as we close. Well, how's your heart today? It's a rhetorical question. You don't have to answer me right now. Uh, but where is your heart? Because time and again, time and again, these stories keep saying that Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Um, other words for that in English might be he was stubborn. He didn't listen. A lot of the scriptures are about how do you listen? Listening to God, not being hard of hearing of faith. Listening to God is really the key to obedience. Staying in God's will and fulfilling God's plan and purpose for your life. So where's your heart? Are you listening and are you going to respond with the courage and faith like Moses and Aaron? Or perhaps it's more, if you're honest or if I'm honest, maybe sometimes there are times where we kind of have a stiff or hardened heart, a stubbornness about our own will, wanting to maintain control. And that's really what Pharaoh was about when he goes out to the River Nile every day. Whoever could control the river really had the power of life in that culture. And understand that, you know, Pharaoh's position was to keep the river in check. You had to keep, you know, everything in its place. The frogs had to stay in check. And when it was a plague of frogs, frogs that was a bad thing. You know, know your place, frogs. I'm not going to let you get free. Same thing with people. Know your place. Stay in your place. Got to stay under control. Know that you're enslaved and stay there. Pharaoh didn't want that loss of control. But where is it in our own lives that we really try to keep control and don't want God to have control? Um, it's about that power or authority that God has over everything. But over the human heart, God has given us free will. So that's something that we'll have to check check in on and, and take to the Lord ourselves. All right, let me wrap this up uh, for chapter 7, uh, getting down to the last paragraph. The river stank. The Egyptians could not drink its water. There was blood throughout the whole land of Egypt. I uh, said, verse 22, the magicians did the same. Um, Pharaoh turned and went into his house. He did not take even this to heart. So again, his heart is hardened. He's not listening to God. He's wanting to maintain control himself. He's not going to let it get to him. Verse 24, all the Egyptians had to dig along the Nile for water to drink. 
Um, it didn't print out on your copy, but there's verse 25 that says, seven days passed. So I mentioned the number seven right at the beginning. Uh, don't mistake that there's an intentionality of this. And I don't know if you've had to go seven days without water. I mean, without a source of water. You know, so this is a suffering. It wasn't just that moment that the, the river turned red for a little while. It was a whole week, or as God would have it, intentionally seven days. Recreation. God is recreating, reordering. God's going to do something new. Pharaoh won't be able to stay in control and hold on to the status quo. God is going to do something new. So this is just the first of ten uh, of the miracles, or as we often call them, the plagues. Uh, but think about it as a miracle. God has a purpose to show his power. Ultimately, it's for compassion, uh, not for destruction, but to reorder or re recreate uh, a new way, a new people, a new community uh, to worship God freely. So things to think about. I'm going to take some questions off air.